So, welcome to the IoT session, which we are going to talk. As I said, we are going to discuss about the IoT, the challenges, which also brings up the opportunity for us, and then the market size and what are the business opportunities we can capture from it. And then we also look at the governance when it comes to policy making and how we can make money out of these things that we are talking about. So, uh, okay, all right. So, from this image, you see IoT is the connected of everything you can think of, right? So, you see IoT in the middle. He said, Hi, I'm IoT. Now, anything around me, you could see that it is interconnected from machine to machine learning. Industrial IoT. Industrial IoT is when we saw an animation of the factory where you can track every stage of the process from where you process the raw materials to the package goods. So, integrated, connected of the vehicles, smart cities, smart grid system. And my name is Prince. I'm the vice president of IoT Network Hub. And then we, uh, I've worked with AITI. Winotech, and then I've also worked with startups. We co-founded startups like Pocket, and then other startups in the agricultural value chain, which is Farmers Hub, and then Agro Demand Pool. I can be reached on my channels, right? And we are looking at IoT. IoT. We've showed, we've seen the videos of how IoT interconnected with everything we do. So IoT is what? It is an interconnectivity of everything you can have around us. The basic requirement is internet. That is why we call it IoT, Internet of Things. And in these things can be anything. It could be a damn device or, for instance, this chair. You can make it smart by making it IoT, which is the incorporation of the sensors and other things that you can see from this slide. Uh, This is one of the definitions you can find from Gareth. Gareth spoke about explaining what IoT is about, and it was like almost anything, including living things, connected to the internet, regardless of location or physical restriction. So it means that anything you can think of, even including living things, regardless of wherever these things can be, you can be able to connect it and then communicate with it with the help of the internet. So we know that the backbone of IoT is internet. Now let's look at the IoT cycle. So what makes a damp device, in this case, this chair, what makes it IoT? So it has to go through the four stages of any damp device to be smart. Those of us who were in the session for the exhibition, you saw how these devices were able to communicate through an app on our phone. So collect, communicate, analyze and act. So any device that goes through this process can be constituted as an IoT device. So collect, what do we do? We are collecting, means that we need what? A source of collection before the device can be smart, from a damp device to a smart device. So collection involves data that we can get from anywhere we happen to find ourselves based on the device which is not smart and we are making it what? Smart. So this, just this is like. Oh. All right. So, just what's happening? So, when you we are the college stage, you are looking at sensors, devices, and any other thing that can be collected with data. So these are sample of sensors that collect data. So we are in the process of making a damp device, which is a device that does not have access to connectivity. You want to make it smart. You need sensors. So these sensors will be used to connect. There are different, different sensors, and each one has its own functionality. Those of us who are at this demo session, you notice that some of them, when you get closer to it, then it reacts. When you touch it, it reacts. These are all sensors which will make changes based on how you act and you program it. So from the sensor, which is the color stage. So from the sensors, you move to communication. 
So once you put in the sensor, the sensor has to communicate through a medium. So the medium can be any form of connectivity through a, a connected device, which is, in this case, you are looking at where the communication will take place. So that is where the introduction of 2G, 3G, and all those connectivity come. And because these IoT devices and the sensors are low-powered devices, it needs low power to be able to communicate data from one medium to the other. In the case of this chair, we now have the sensors on this chair, right? Now, how do you communicate with the sensors? That is when this communication protocols comes in, whether you are looking at Bluetooth, local area network, 3G, 5G, 6G, and other communicated channels. So once you have this connectivity, you are looking forward to analyze it, right? So in this case, we have our sensor on this chair, and then we have the device connected to it. The next medium is how are you going to get to the connectivity? Let's say we have connected a low power internet connectivity to it, which are connecting data from it. So once we have the data, in this case, how do we analyze the data that we are getting from the chair? Uh, one of the data you can analyze, maybe the number of times you will sit on it. Or it could tell you, you have sat on it for long. Stand up and stretch. So once you get the data and you are communicating with the data, you need to analyze the data to be able to give out meaningful information to the end user. So there are other IoT platforms that you can have. So go back. So at the art stage is where you'll be able to act on the data that you receive from the, the, the devices or the sensors. In this case, you're looking at this chair. Now the data is where the number of times people sit on the chair, a different number of people who are sat on the chair, and other things we can, we can think of. So once you have that, now you're going to act on the data. It's going to ask through a medium, a web app, a mobile app, or any form of device that can present the information that this chair is gathering. So let's say you have an app. So the app will tell you, oh, okay, when this chair was manufactured, it was manufactured from this company, so and so, purchased by this one, this is the current owner, and then the number of times people have sat on this chair, <laughs> and then the number of different people who have sat on this chair, and other data that you want to act on it. So when you have the app, the app will be able to analyze and give you what? The information that you need in order to make decisions based on what you receive on the app. And then we are looking at the applications. We are going to talk about the applications of IoT, both in any of the industries that we can have. So application of IoT. We have the smart agricultural system. Earlier on, I spoke about a startup that we are working with, which is uh, Farmers Hub. So it's also an incorporation of IoT in there. So imagine the situation, you have your small farm, you'll be able to manage the farm from wherever you happen to find yourself with the use of IoT. So the farm is now what? A smart farm and what? A smart agricultural technology. You can be able to diagnose disease on time. You'll be able to also determine the rate at which the crops are being grown on the farm. You can be able to also determine the number of times the soil moisture content, humidity content. Even when the crop is ready, you're able to determine how the moisture content of the cereals that you use all through the use of IoT. So from at any point in time, you'll be able to manage and see what is happening on the farm through the use of IoT. And then we have a smart irrigation system. Uh, gone were the days where you would have to wake up, get a bucket of water, water the garden or the flowers or the farm. Imagine you have a big farm. How would you be able to water all the crops from one point to the other? That is where the introduction of smart irrigation system comes in. So it incorporates on the field with the use of IoT, a connected device, and some sensors. You'll be able to map the entire field of the farm, set up all these systems on the farm, and then you'll be able to use it to, to get data and the farm or the smart system will be able to irrigate the farm 
based on the times that you set it to irrigate automatically. So you're automating the irrigation system. The next one we are going to talk about is the health monitoring system. The health monitoring system, you can have situations where you want to monitor your health. So there are a couple of devices that is been out there, like the smart watches, the smart fit band, and others, the necklace and all that. That is taking records of what you do on a daily basis. These are all the incorporation of what? IoT. So this particular system, looking at the smart system, you'll be able to communicate with your doctor without having to get closer to the doctor in person. With the use of IoT and a smart health system, your data or your vitals will be able to be able to push the data to the health professional or a doctor, where this doctor will analyze your data and give you results without seeing the person in person. And this will also help you to be able to give it to me. So, all right, so with the health monitoring system, you'll be able to provide data to your doctor and your doctor can suggest what you could do or guidance if there's a need for you to come in person or advise you on what to do with your vitals and your health condition. Now we are looking at home automation. We did a demo on home automation at our exhibition session. So home automation is being able to connect all your home appliances through the use of IoT devices and sensors where you can manage it from the comfort of your home or wherever you find yourself through the use of an app. You can think of any devices in the home, which is the home appliances, like your fridge, your air conditioning, your lighting system. The entire room could be automated through the use of IoT. So what we have here is IoT automation, which can be able to communicate through the use of a phone. And then we have the air pollution monitoring system. Uh, in our part of the world, we don't really talk much about air pollution, but it's as a critical at its test. You should be able to determine the status of every air or the quality of the air wherever we're having to find ourselves. It, could, it should be a standard. For instance, if I'm to enter this auditorium, I should see the quality, the, the quality of air in the room through a smart device where I can see what is happening in the room. And it is a standard in some of the European countries. So at a garden like this, you should be able to have these sensors and this display telling you the quality of the air in the room. So this smart air pollution system currently detects the particle matter in the atmosphere and alerts you what is the current condition or what is the quality of air in wherever you find yourself, provided that sensor is in the room or the environment you are checking the air from. And then we have a weather monitoring system. Uh, those days, we were just sitting behind the TV and wait for the meteorological department to come and brief us about the weather. And then we move on to smartphones, where our smartphones can tell us the weather. There's also an IoT system, which is the weather monitoring system, that can give you timely updates as to the weather condition of a city or wherever you find yourself. It goes further to alert you as to some of the disasters that might happen or the temperature or the wind, the wind speed at a particular area that also alerts you for other hazardous activities that might happen when you are not even aware or before the meteorological department will also alert you on that. And then we have a face recognition AI robot. <laughs> this is interesting. Uh, we did also a presentation on the other side where uh, on the exhibition stand where we have a whole system where it will detect who comes in with the RFID. So this is the case where in an employee management system where you'll be able to determine which or who employee comes to the office. It will be an entrance in where you'll be in front of the door, the system scans your face, and then it will detect whether you are authorized to enter or you are not authorized to enter. We have the smart garage door. We also see that this is also part of the home automation ecosystem where you'll be able to control your garage with an app on your phone through the smart garage door to detect whether you are getting close to the garage and then it will open automatically for you or you have to control it with the app on your phone. And then the smart traffic management system. 
uh, this is a smart city project and a smart traffic force and a smart city project where everything on the city or in a city is communicated is communicating with each other so the smart traffic system will be able to determine the first our current smart our current traffic system works in a case that it works with timing so when they program the traffic light it goes to red for some time which is two minutes maximum or minimum of one minute then it gives access to the other vehicles on the road you will notice that most of the time even though some of the roads there are no cars on them the light also still stays what green for other cars to move imagine a system where the traffic system is smart it's smart enough to know the number of vehicles on each of the roads so it, it gives priority to the vehicles with a lot of the roads with a lot of traffic on the road so that it doesn't cause too much traffic on the road so you imagine a situation where two intersections one of them has lesser cars the other has more cars so the system will be able to determine which of the roads has more vehicles on the road so that it gives priority to those areas also it has priority to the ambulance and other services that we want to have in the smart traffic system and then a flood detection system this system is interesting because it has sensors at the base of a bridge or a foot lever so at any point in time when the level reaches that when the water reaches that level the system through alerts based on recent predictions that when the level is up to that point there's likelihood of flood so all those people in those areas when the water level gets to that point they will get an alert or a notification or an announcement or how the data will be analyzed and presented to them so that they can prepare and evacuate the area and then the smart parking system you would have situations where people will park in independent areas so the smart parking system will be able to tell each and everyone who is using the app to be able to know where and which area to park it will analyze the road and then tell the number of vehicles who are parked in that particular area and then once you see that you know that oh i'll be able to park at this position or this area or this point and the smart alarm system this smart alarm system does what our alarms do by notifying you when you set the alarms and other things but this has more things to do with it with the incorporation of iot and the internet as a whole so to be able to speak to you should be able to speak to it with your voice talk to it to set alarms and it will remind you as to when and why you want to wake up and your sleeping patterns and habits so i would more analyze the data respond to you and give you meaningful information that will help you in your daily lives and activities a uh, smart guest system we did we did a demo at the, at the exhibition and one man was asking about what about gas how do you determine we have a system that will be able to determine the composition of gas in an atmosphere or in an area so this smart gas system detects what is in the area and alerts you how hazardous that gas is so that you can flee away or prepare and get from that area street light monitoring system I think this should be deployed in our part of the world because as we were coming this morning, we saw a lot of street lights that are on in situations where you have street lights monitored all over the places. Imagine a smart street light system that will be able to determine the time of the day. So it goes on based on the time of the day and goes off based on the time of the day. You don't have to control. According, they came to fix one in our area and we were told that you have to go and turn it on and off all the time so when you want it to be on when the night is getting close you turn it on and then when it's morning you go and turn it off this smart street system will be able to monitor what is happening the time of the day and then it will be able to tell you big data and have a big dashboard where you can act on the data as well the li liquid monitoring system this will be for any form of liquid you want to monitor the level this is used in use cases where the fueling systems and then the petrol tankers who are in these areas. 
So you would have this sensor that would determine the level of the liquid in an enclosure, whether a tank or a barrel or any form of shape that will be able to measure. So once you get that information, with the help of an app, you'll be able to tell the level of liquid in that container. Uh, you, you could see most of the filling stations in our part of the world where they have a big, a long stick. So in order to measure the level of the liquid or the fuel, they dip the, the level into it, and then they could determine the high, the level of, you need a, a smart liquid system to be able to determine. You don't have to do that anymore. And then mining is very critical in our parts of the world and in other European countries. So this smart helmet system is for miners. You would have a situation where your miners go deep down to the, to the level. So this smart helmet system will be able to track and identify who and where each and every miner is. So you don't have to, when there's any disaster, you can be able to determine where this person is and who this person is and where they were at the moment of their disaster and can be able to track them and find them when the disaster happens. A smart anti-theft system. This is interesting. This, so uh, this is like you, when you, you have your home and you are leaving the home, this is also part of the home automation system where for intruder purposes, when you are leaving the home, you set on the smart anti theft system that will determine if any person comes to your home when you are not around. You'll be able to get an instant update and also at a point where you can call emergency services when an intruder gets into your house. <clears throat> and a smart grid system. This is more deployed in the Western world, but we also have to see these potentials in our part of the world where our energy system will be on a smart system. That will determine where this load shedding and all these things. If you have a smart grid system, the system will be able to determine which area needs more power. And it can schedule it based on where each and every person or area is coming from, based on the consumption rate of those people in the area. So it doesn't have to be like, you are giving this person more power, but they don't even deserve it as they all give rise to this low shedding and other things that will come up. Challenges in IoT. Most of these technologies we spoke about are innovative and are interesting. But it comes with a challenge. And the challenge also is an opportunity for us to be able to deploy solutions that will help us make money out of it. So we are looking at it from the technology, the business, and the societal point of view. For technology aspect, you are looking at a technology in situations where systems are poorly designed. Because these IoT devices come from different, different OEMs, they set up and define it based on their ecosystem. So you can have situations where Apple has its own smart kits, you have Google has its own smart system, Alexa or Amazon has their own smart system. So each one has its own way of designing it. And since this is a new technology, deployment and burden becomes new and people are so much in a hurry. They design and it becomes failure and hackers get into the system and they can hack it and present get data and use it for whatever they want to use it for. And you also talk about standards. Because all these organizations have their own devices, it is hard for us to have one standard to use across all home devices kits. In this case, which I mentioned, Apple, Google, and then whole Amazon. So they have their own home kit. But there's no standard of deploying for all these services. If you want to do it, you have to go specifically to each of these companies. And then security and privacy. When we mention IoT, we mention security and privacy. There's an argument in Europe which determines like which of the data becomes public to the general and then which one is private. And a use case is uh, the groceries in your fridge. Is that data available to the public or should be personal to you, the homeowner? So there are a lot of privacy and policies that are going on globally on how and the challenges with IoT comes in and how we can solve them. Connectivity is also a big challenge in our part of the world because the backbone of IoT is the internet. So when you mention internet, any internet in any form is required for this IoT to work. So internet is a very critical challenge for us and we have to define and get this 
OEMs and organizations and the stakeholders involved to help us set up these connectivities to help us join and build the IoT network. Compatibility and longevity. As I made mention about these different different OEMs who are building these devices, how are they working together with each other? They are not at this point because when you buy a specific device for an Apple, you are stick to only the Apple ecosystem. It doesn't work in other the other other the system in other the systems. So we need to find a standard across all these places where it will be compatible across each of these platforms. The business also aspect is also kind of critical because uh, you have the commercialization, you have the com consumer IoT and industrial IoT. At any point in time, which solution are you deploying and which of the customer segments are you targeting? Are you targeting the consumers, me and you, or the industries, or the commercial purposes at the enterprise places? And the society, is a society we use systems. So how do we deploy the systems in order for us to be able to use it in our point? People are used to a way of thinking and a way of using a product or a service. How do you incorporate IoT into it in the points of voice transitioning and other different approaches that you want to use for your device or your setup? Opportunities, we spoke of the challenges. Also, all these challenges present opportunity for us, you and I, to be able to build solutions around these spaces. First, we are looking at the future of the IoT devices. This research from Economic Impact predicted that 6 trillion, from 3 trillion to 6 trillion market size of IoT by 2025. And this figure was conducted in 2013, and they predicted 2025, and by 2020, these devices and with the, the pandemic also kind of fast track this IoT deployment, especially in Asia and Europe. So career opportunities, there is data analysis where you could study what we call data analysis. You'll be able to analyze the data that these devices are pro, pro producing, which you can make meaningful means out of it. There are engineers who are data analyst engineers where they analyze the data find the model, design AI models on top of the data that could predict. The network and infrastructure is an opportunity. You have network engineers in this area where you could be able to set up an infrastructure through the network connectivity and build systems on top of them. And then security experts, as long as there are bad people attacking the system, we should have good people who will protect the bad ones from attacking the system. And then the hardware devices also. We have engineers, embedded engineers, who will build and communicate with these devices to be able to communicate on the app and our phones. And an application, application, we talk about developers, building mobile apps, mobile platforms, and other services to be able to act on the data. Policy and governance. I saw something. So let's talk about policy and government we can end. So this is a proposal from the European Union, but I think we should also look at how we can manage what we have here. And as we are looking for the future and evolution, we should be able to set up some kind of policy and governance for those of us who are into the space and who are to board devices and also businesses around the space. We talks about the new form of government. We need to have a whole government on deciding which data will be available for the public, which data is private, and how these equipment and devices will be picking the data from our, our homes and private areas. And then the role of government to provide the system need for innovation and opportunities in those spaces as well. Uh, as I bring my presenting to an end, we would have some session for questions and then I'll be available for the expert panel discussion also as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> questions, questions? You could have many minutes for questions. Five. Five minutes for questions. Any question? Wow, oh, no question. Um, you've really given us a rundown of what IoT can do. 
but I'm still not getting the aspect where it channels up to um, job creation, where the youth can come in. And I'm looking at where payments also come because some of the youth are running away from this programs because it's expensive. What is the organization doing to make sure that some of those costs are really cut down so that someone from SHS, instead of even looking at university, can veer into it and have something doing by the end of the day? Thanks. Okay, so uh, thank you for the question. We spoke about the opportunities in the IoT space. So these opportunities are also presenting themselves for people to train themselves and prepare themselves for the future. You spoke about SHS students and how we can introduce these to them. This is why these sessions are also important for them to know. So if an SHS student is here and listening to it, he or she will have the opportunity, oh, so if I want to go into IoT, there is data analysis, there is hardware and device engineers, embedded system engineers, network infrastructure engineers, where I can prepare myself to be one of these people so that I can work in IoT or build my IoT myself or work in any IoT industry. And we also provide services and training for these younger kids who will be able to learn and prepare themselves for the new future of work that we spoke about. So these are the opportunities that we spoke. There's a lot of opportunity in the space, but we are talking about what is here and how students or people or students who are not sure or even industry persons it can also create opportunity for them to give us the opportunity to go and talk to these people these students in their schools and prepare themselves for the future as we, we know we know it last question oh, okay if there's time that will... all right so i'm going to hand over to joshua and then he will talk about Industry 4.0 and the future of the job. I'm sure your question will be answered in this slide also as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prince. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoy his session, the Internet of Things. So I'm going to go deep into the future of technology. I'm going to touch about a number of new technologies coming up in our world today, the potential power they have to disrupt industries in our lives, and how best we can take advantage over all these new technologies. Um, so I'm going to talk on Industry 4.0. We'll figure out why Industry 4.0, and then the future of jobs. So my name is Joshua Pukwajiman, and I happen to be the president for the IIT Network Hub. Um, we talk about the IIT Network Hub in my presentation too as well. I also run a startup called Personet. You can connect with me on the various platforms, and that's my contact active on WhatsApp. Now, a quote from Klaus Schwab. He happens to be the founder for the World Economic Forum. If any one of you heard of the World Economic Forum, this guy is the founder, and he said that we must develop a comprehensive and global shared view of how technology is affecting lives and reshaping our economy, social, culture, and human environments. There has never been a time of greater promise or greater peri than the time we are in today because of this fourth industrial revolution. Now we talk about fourth industrial revolution. We have industry, we have revolution. Industry is the work and process involved in collecting raw materials and making them into products in factories. Now when we talk about revolution, revolution two are the great turning point of history, a stimulus and transformative event that attempts to change a nation, a region, society, or in case, even the whole world as a whole. And what we are experiencing now is a, one of the great revolution in our, in our history of humanity um, called the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Now, when we talk about the Fourth Industrial Revolution or Industrial Revolution, um, we are looking at the process of change from the agrarian. So the agrarian age is where our four forefathers or great great forefathers used to hunt and cultivate crops as a means of livelihood. Before then, there was no job. All they do is agriculture and hunting. That's the agrarian age. So the process of transferring from that age to the industrial age, where industries and machines were being put into manufacturing, is what we call the industrial revolution. And the main features involved in the industrial revolution were technological, socioeconomic, and cultural. Now we're looking at the industrial revolutions. Our world has experienced four series of industrial revolutions as of now. 
we have the first industrial revolution, which happened in 1765. Um, that was when the world discovered steam engine. So the steam engine powered our railway networks, it powered our ships, and that gave up or gave birth to a whole new revolution where people now have to move from hunting agriculture to working in the factories because we have to build the railways, we have to build the ships, we have to build the ports. So it created a whole new industry and a whole new world for those generations. Then we had the second industrial revolution where we discovered the electricity, um, the oil, and then the mass production. So that's when vehicles were invented. So when vehicles came to, it created a whole automobile industry. We have to build road networks. We have to have filling stations. We have to have oil refineries. Also created a whole new revolution for humanity where we have to move from manual work to electric powered works. And that also give back to all the electrical appliances we have in our world today. From the TV, the fridge, the, all the appliances you can think about. It started from the second industrial revolution. Then we came to the third industrial revolution where we have the computers and the internet. They also came to change our world. It changed how we live our life, how we work today. Today we are all here because as a result of all this revolution happening. Now most of our business are going digital. We are here talking about Digital Innovation Week. It's because of, uh, as a result of the, three, or the third industrial revolution, where the internet was born, computers were born, everything started getting connected. Now our works, our schools, everything is now online. That's the third digital, or the third industrial revolution. Now today, there's a new revolution happening beneath our skins and beneath in the shadows. We are using them, but we might not be aware. And it's called the fourth industrial revolution. That's also powered by new technologies such as the Internet of Things, which Prince talked about. We're talking about AI, or artificial intelligence. We're talking about 3D printing. We're talking about the virtual reality, the blockchain, pipe, Bitcoin. We're talking about cyber security. And a whole lot of new technologies coming up in our generation now moving forward the fourth industrial revolution. And these technologies are also going to change our world, create new industries, and change how we live our life. Now these are some of the technologies coming together to push the industry 4.0, or the fourth industrial revolution. Now when we talk about fourth industrial revolution, we're looking at a way of describing the brain between boundaries, both physical, biological, and digital world. So these three different worlds, we're going to blend their boundaries together. So we're going to have a blend of physical, digital, and biological messed up together. And it's a fusion of artificial intelligence, the robotics, the internet of things, 3D printing, genetic engineering, quantum computing, and other new technologies coming up. Now, I'm sure you've heard of 5G probably last year when COVID came. So 5G is out now in most part of the developed countries. They run on 5G. And the beauty of 5G is that we can have 10 to 100 times the speed and then the power of the 4G. So with 5G, you can download one gig movie in a second. You can connect to so many devices. So this 5G is going to connect everything to the internet. It's going to power the IoT revolution. That means everything will be connected, wherever you are. You can have people in the village having access to quality education, quality healthcare, because they are all connected. Another technology we'll look at is the artificial intelligence. If you use Snapchat, Instagram, you use filters, you use tagging, facial recognition, they're all AIs. If you use Uber, AI. If you use Jumia, Amazon, you're all using AI tools. So they are embedded in the fabrics of our society today, in our apps, in our lives, and we use them every day. So that's AI. And AI is going to be, AI is an intelligent system. Or humans trying to build a system that can mimic the human intelligence. So we literally trying to build a machine that can think like human. That's the whole concept of AI. And with that power, machine will be able to do a lot of things. And these are the reason why all these technologies are literally taking away jobs, especially the old jobs, right? Or the routine jobs. So we look at some of the jobs that all these technologies are going to displace. And the new ones are going to also create as well. Now we talk about the IoT. Um, Prince talked a lot about IoT, so I'm not going to talk much about that. So basically connecting everything to the internet. Not just our laptops, our phones, our TVs, but our fridge, our shoes, our house, our cars, our streets, everything we can imagine are going to be connected to the internet. Then we have the robotics coming into our industries and our homes, automating processes and tasks. 
So most of the factories in the developed countries are going automation from warehouse to assembly lines, even in our homes, nannies are being replaced. We have robots that can cook, robots that can wash, robots that can do so many things, and they are coming. We also have the virtual reality and augmented reality. So with this, you can have immersive experience from wherever you are. You can be sitting here, and you can experience being in a Zoom, being in the cinema, being at a church, being at a conference, be everywhere. So we could literally have this conference from our bedroom, and you feel yourself like you're sitting here listening to me. So that's the beauty of the virtual reality. And it's going to change the way, the way we connect with each other, the way we experience things on the internet. And the mother of this is called the metaverse. If you ever heard Facebook changing their name to Meta, it's because of this great technology. Now, very soon we're going to be in the Metaverse where we can experience everything as if we are in with all the technology happening. So that's the future of this technology as well. Then we have the blockchain technology, which is powering the most popular cryptocurrency called Bitcoin. If you ever heard about Bitcoin, Bitcoin is built on blockchain. It's one of the powerful technology for security and transparency for smart contracts, for cryptocurrency, for NFTs. A, a whole new industries have been built on this single technology, from banking system and all that you can think about. So this is one also of the technologies that's going to displace a lot of jobs by creating new industries and new jobs. Now we have the 3D printing. Today, in some part of the world, you can print a house in 24 hours using 3D printer. In the medical space, you can print lungs, you can print bones, tissue, ligaments. And this is also changing all industries. It's not just construction or homes or arts or crafts. Everywhere you can imagine, 3D printing is disrupting those industries. Now, we look at some of the challenges all these new technologies are bringing. These are just few of them. There are so many of them coming up, and they are called emerging technologies. So if you have time, you can read about them. The challenges and opportunities these technologies are bringing to us, our generation, especially the young ones. According to a report from the World Economic Forum, um, they said students that are entering into primary school, so those in the primary school and GSS, by the time they are out of university, the kind of jobs they are seeking to do are yet to be created. So their jobs do not yet exist. Those who want to be doctor, lawyer, and stuff, most of them, by the time they get to university and they are out, those jobs will no more be there. All right, so we'll look at the new jobs that are going to be created too as well. Um, a report too also said that, um, according to McKenzie Global Research, they're saying that um, AI and automation is going to impact most of the developed countries, mostly UK, German, and US. And then by 2030, we're going to have 800 million workers displaced from their workplace globally. All right. All right. So COVID-19 is pushing companies to, um, to scale remotely. That's 83% of companies saying COVID has been helping them or had pushed most of their staff to work from home. And that's also called a gig economy, where you can literally be anywhere and work for anybody across the globe. Then 84% also said um, COVID has helped them to accelerate digitization. And Ghana, too, would be proud for COVID because COVID also had helped us to also push or accelerate digitization. 50% um, also said it has also helped them to accelerate automation. Um, according to this report, they also said as at 2020, um, we have 67% of human doing most of the work and then 33% being machines. By 2025, we're going to have 53% of human working and then 47% of the job being done by machines. Now, when you look at the future of jobs, um, unfortunately, there's an equality issue again, where the shares of women in that space of new jobs, the future of work, is very, very limited. So there's also the need to get more women or girls to push into the STEM space so they can also have a major share in the future of work. Now, according to the report, by 2025, all employees, 50% of them, will need to risk skill. If you don't risk skill, if you don't learn a new skill, you will lose your job. Now, 40% too are expected to risk skill in the next five years. The same report also says that for you to be able to acquire new skills, 
Um, these are the skills and the duration of which you can be able to acquire them. So between one to two months, these are the kind of skills you can acquire. Between two to three months, these are the skills. And then between four to five months, the skills you can also acquire as well. Then according to employers, they said two out of three um, investment that they do in risk killing, they are also looking for return of investment. So now employers don't want to build their capacity. Then you leave them and work for other company because you have upgraded your skills. They also want to retain them so they can have the return on their investment. Now, when you look at the job landscape, um, by 2025, we're going to have 85 million job lost. And the same technology we've mentioned are going to create 97, new mi mi 97 million new jobs, which do not yet exist. And these jobs to require skills we don't have. Because most of the, the jobs you're looking at are data analysts and scientists, um, AI machine learning specialists, big data specialists, uh, digital marketing and strategy specialists, process automation specialists, all the list over there. This, you can hardly get them from the classroom, especially in our, our current form of education. You can't learn AI from the classroom. You can't learn robotics from the classroom. So it's becoming a challenge, and that's some of the challenges that we're going to face going forward. Now, these are the top 10 skills that is required by every industry in, in the world. By 2025, if you have all these skills, you can work anywhere in the world. You can work for any company in the world. And the skills are, are as follows. Analytical thinking and innovation, active learning and learning strategies, complex problem solving, um, critical thinking and analysis, um, creativity, originality and initiative, and the list over there. So the world is looking at people who can solve problems. So all the blues are geared toward problem solving. All the greens are self-management. Your ability to manage yourself, be flexible at workplace, and be able to work with machines at the workplace. Then we're looking at working with people. Um, due to the fact that machines are going to do most of the job, we also need humans to be able to do what humans do better, like interaction, communication, collaboration, creativity. These are things machines can easily do, that humans now have to rethink what kind of skills we need to acquire to be able to stay relevant in the future. Now, another report also said that this transformation, if managed wisely, like all these new technologies that are coming, the challenges and opportunities they are bringing, if we're able to manage them very wisely, we could lead to a new age of good work and good jobs and improve quality of life for all. But if we manage poorly, like if we don't build capacity in AI, in robotics, in IoT, 3D printing, because that's where all the new industries are going to be, if we fall or uh, we manage them poorly, we're going to be doomed. I think um, everybody heard a vice president talking about 4IR, the fourth industrial revolution. These are the opportunities and challenges that if we fail to build our capacity, to prepare ourselves, to get ready for this revolution, we will be left behind, not just from the world, but we'll be disconnected from the world. Because the world is going to be on 5G and 6G. All devices are going to be 6G powered, 5G powered. If you're not prepared, we can't connect to the world. Right. So what we can do to be ready for the fourth industrial revolution, one, well, we need to redefine the purpose of education. Education can't just be getting certification to get a job, not in the 21st century. 21st century is skill-based. You've been able to acquire the necessary skill, the relevant skill to stay competitive in the industry. You can even get a job if you don't have a certification. As long as you have the right skills, and you can do the job. That's how we need to repurpose education. We also need to improve STEAM education. It used to be STEM, but now we've added art and design. Art and design because machines are very poor at creative imagination and design. And that's what humans will do better. So we're bringing art back to the educational process. All education has to be practical. It has to be hands-on. And it has to be geared towards science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. This is where the future of jobs are going to be. We also need to develop human potentials. The gifts and then the talent we have need to be nurtured and built to solve the problems that the world is going to face. Today we face climate change, unemployment, our population, and a lot of problems that are going to come in the future. So we should be able to build human potentials that are capable to solve the problems of the future. Now we need to, to adapt to life learning models. You can't finish learning or you can't complete learning after school. Because the world we're going to live in is going to be in a constant change that if you fail to learn a new skill in five years, you will likely not have a job. So we need to be a live learner and constantly be learning. Then we need to also alter educator training. So the way our teachers train us 
It's not helping. We can't memorize and pour. Machine does that better. You can talk to Google Assistant. In a second, it can pull you all information that human can memorize and tell you in a second. So when it comes to data, crunching of numbers, machines are doing that better and better than human. So the way we teach has to change. We should be able to teach people how to solve problems, how to think, how to be creative. This is the way to go to be ready for the fourth industrial revolution. We also need maker spaces in our schools. We should have a center where students can go there, imagine something and create. Like with 3D printers, they can design something that comes out of their mind, their imagination, and then print them out. They should be able to find problems at the campus, go to the maker space and build solution for that. So we need a maker space to drive all this hands-on practical education in our system. They also need to change our higher education. Four years in the university for a degree is not, it's too, it's too much. By the time you complete your four years, whatever you've learned will be obsolete. So we need to be able to find ways to make sure higher education is driven based on skill base. That within a short possible time, you can acquire the skills that is needed at that time and then use that to work. And whilst you're working, you're also building up, reskilling up. Four years is too much to get a needed skill to get a job. All right. All right. A quote from Aventofla, he said, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn and relearn. So in this generation that we are in, if you can read and write, but then you can't learn, you can't relearn and unlearn, you are illiterate. So it's not a matter of I went to school, I can read, I can write. In our generation, if you can't do these three, you'll be left behind. Now, on the roadmap for the industrial revolution, we've gone through the first, the second, the third, the fourth. Now, there's a fifth coming. <laughs> so, from 2020 to the next years ahead, the next 30, 40 years to come, we're going to look at mass customization. This is where you can get your preference products, your preference meal, everything customized to your need. At that time, we'll have 5G, probably 6G. By that time, AI is everywhere, IT is everywhere. So now the systems are going to collect data from you, learn from your preference, and then provide service that is tailored to only you. That's the fifth industrial revolution coming. So if we miss this fourth, we're going to be doomed in the fifth. <laughs> All right. So um, this is why it's very critical to have this session here to talk about the fourth industrial revolution, the technologies that are driving them, the challenges that they are coming with, and the opportunities that are in for everyone, both um, business people, policymakers, entrepreneurs, and students. Now, the, the last stage of my presentation is going to talk about our organization and what we're doing here in Ghana and Africa. So, the IoT Network Hub, we call ourselves the community of the future. Because we believe that these technologies are going to shape our future. And if we mess up, we don't build our capacity and knowledge base in it and start building solutions with them. The new industries are not going to be created for us, and we can't import industries to our country. So, we have to build our own new industries for the future. All right. A quote from Alan Kane, he said, the best way to predict the future is to invent it or to create it. And that's what we seek to do at IoT Network Hub. IoT Network Hub is a community of uh, about 10,000 membership. And we are a community of inventors, innovators, makers, developers, engineers, um, students, and everybody who is passionate about technology. And our purpose is to come together, explore these new technologies I just took you through, and how best you can be able to use them to solve Africans' problem. Our mission is to build digital communities and empower this technology to solve Africa's problem. And our vision is to be the hub of emerging technologies in Africa. Our core goals are to build an um, ecosystem across the African continent, which we've started working for five years now. And we also seek to democratize digital skills of the future. We also want to foster creative thinking, innovations, and problem solving. Uh, our core activities have been our monthly meetup. Every month we do have meetup. It's free for participation. You can come and learn new skills for free and then get a new job. You can come and meet people, find your partner, and then start your, start your business. You can have a challenge with your project or design your work. And you can come to the session, present, and then we get people to help you, mentor you, and guide you through it. We also have awareness and capacity building. We do community outreach. We do events and conferences, workshop hackathons and boot camps for students, both kids, tertiary and all cycles right and then we're also looking at um, building smart cities so somebody have to turn our country to smart city where all the IT solutions the AI can all come into emergence to help us uh, reshape or create a future of our, our cities 
No, our vision is to have our chapter across African countries, uh, regional state, tertiary, second cycle, uh, grow our membership to 1 million by 2025, um, our smart city project, and build more partnership and collaboration for this movement. Um, our journey, we started back in 2017, 1617, um, and we started with a few couple of friends, and today we've been <coughs> going far. By 2017, 2018, we have our first workshop. The vice president was there. And then we also showcased some of the innovation we started back in 2017, 2018. Um, 2018, we do have meetups. So these are pictures from some of our activities. And 2019, our number keep growing exponentially. Then in 2019, we have a party at the end of the year to bring innovators, people together to have fun, build techs, play games. We, we want to build a culture of innovation and creativity that people feel belonging to a place where they can come and build stuff, learn new things. So 2020, before COVID, we had, I think, January, February, before March, COVID came. So these are pictures from our session. We do sessions on AI, robotics, cybersecurity, whatever you want to learn, as far as emerging technology is concerned. Your place to go is the IT New Tech Hub. Now, our community, a uh, quote from Alan Kern said, alone we can do so little, but together we can go far. Or we can do so much. Um, our chapters across Africa, um, over there, then our chapters across Ghana, we are in almost all the regions in the country. Wherever you are from, you'll be able to meet a chapter there and then join a community, learn a skill for free, and prepare yourself for the future. Um, we've also gone to the campuses where we're creating clubs, the IIT clubs on the various campuses, try to expose them to these new skills that they have to acquire aside their certification so they can also prepare for themselves. It doesn't make sense to graduate from university for four years and come home looking for a job. You should have a job before you graduate. If you have the skills, you have, you have the passion for what you do, you should get away before you leave the school. And some of our initiatives are over there. You have the IIT for her, focus on women in STEM. We have the IIT Robotics, IIT for Kids, and then the rest. Um, our projects, um, ever since we started, um, I mentioned we are exploring these next technologies. We will also be able to build solutions using them, and I will talk about some of the innovation we build using all these technologies. A quote from Albert Einstein, he said, we cannot solve our problem using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. So we need to think different if you're going to solve all the problems we are in today. And that required that we we go a lot into our creative mindset, be able to be creative, think outside the box, and all, all the other things. All right. When it comes to STEM projects, uh, we do organize STEM projects for tertiary cycle. Uh, we do organize some too for senior high. We go to campuses to expose them to STEM, where they learn how to program, learn IoT, robotics, among others. We also do engage junior high cycle in 3D printing, virtual reality, all these technologies here are here in Ghana, and we are, we are using them here in Ghana to build or prepare the younger generation for the future. And we also do have programs for kids, where we teach kids robotics, among other things. So this is one robot that was locally built here through our training program with the kids. They're able to learn how to build their own robots, program them, assemble everything, and then they took them home. Every kid had a robot. When it comes to um, development, apart from training, we also build IoT solutions. And these are some of the IoT chips or boards we design here locally in Ghana. Um, this, on the stream left, is a thermostat. It's, it's monitor temperature and humidity data. And wherever you are, you can be able to monitor your warehouse, your storage facility from your phone. We also have this for smart bin, where you can monitor the level of your bin and know whenever it's due for um, disposer, the collectors can get notification that your beans are full and they'll come and pick them up. This is for controlling your appliances in the home. So with this device and your phone on an app on the phone, you're able to control your fridge, your TV, as he mentioned earlier. So these are the finished products. The, all the casing too were 3D printed. So we designed the case, we 3D printed them, then we case that product. So when COVID came to, we, we look at how best we can create something to help fight COVID. So this was um, a 3D printed face mask. It's reusable, it's recyclable, and it's very low cost. So we saw that when face masks came earlier last year, you have to use and dispose them. So every day you have to buy a new one. So with this, you just have to replace the filter, which was very, very affordable. 
also came out with the first face shield in the country as of March 2020. So this face shield was to help block any contact through the fluid to get it into your eyes. It was mainly for the um, customer service people. Those are the front decks. They also noticed that when you put the mask on your ear for long, especially the initial when it came, the locally made one, the band was too big that it, it hurts your ears. So we came up with this to help hold the marks at your back. Then the finally, the touchless Veronica bucket. When Veronica bucket came, it was manual. You have to open the tab, wash your hand. When you finish washing, you have to touch it again and then close it. That could also be the medium where the virus could be transmitting. So we came up with a touchless one with a sensor that allows the flow of water by putting your hands beneath. So these are some of the innovations that we've been working on um, since last year. And they are all here at our booth. You can go there and then see the demonstration or go check them out. Right. And then we also built COVID-19 disinfected boots. Even when you go to the mall and some of the supermarkets, you realize that you have to go through your boots. Even we have some here, it sprays on you. Yeah, so as at April 2020, we built seven of these for a number of companies in, in Accra. Right. Then um, we also built We also design our own uh, temperature guns locally. We produce a number of them that are being used. Then we, we, we supply some to the ministry. Some ministries receive some of this from us. Um, our project we're looking at building is a smart city I mentioned. I'll be able to collect data about environment and share them with the people in the environment. It's a project we're also looking at working on. Um, a quote from the late Kofiana, he said, any society that failed to tap into the creative power of their youths will be left behind. So as I mentioned, the readiness, one of the readiness was human potentials. If we fail to tap into this human potential of the younger generation, the whole country will be left behind. All right. So that brings me to the end of my session. Thank you, and I'll take questions if any. You can also join our community. You can pick this number. It's uh, active on WhatsApp and join our community if you want to. All right. And I encourage everybody to join. Because we have a meeting. We have a program coming up this Saturday. We're going to talk about 5G and 6G and how they're going to change our life and our businesses and the industries they're going to disrupt and opportunities they're going to create. So please, if there are questions, I'd like to take questions. Please, are there questions? Well, if there's no question, we can bring our session to an end. <laughs> All right, so we, we have a demonstration here. We can do a small demo for you. So it's um, IoT and AI blended together. So Prince, if you can come and help us. So what we have here, it's called <laughs> Amma. Well, the name is a Google Home device, which is a voice automated device that you can talk to it for anything. But this is actually Amma because it's a smart receptionist. It's a smart receptionist in the sense that when you go to the office, it's going to a project we are working on with SD Innovate. And so if you go to the entrance, you would have to talk to it and then it will guide you to wherever you want to go or who you want to visit. And you can also ask for it to give you some directions to some office places. So we call it AMA. So I'm going to talk to AMA and AMA will respond to me and then I'll ask some few questions about the Innovate Hub around, uh, it's called it's the SG Bank Innovate Hub. So this has been designed for that particular scenario. I'm fine. You're very kind to ask, especially in these tempestuous times. All right, so I'm going to talk to Amma, and Amma is going to respond to me. Hey, Google. Talk to Amma. Okay, here's the test version of Amma. Hello, my name is Amma, your automated assistant. Welcome to SG Ghana Innovate. How may I help you? I want to talk.
Sorry, I didn't catch that. Can you try again? I want to take me a tour of the place. Would you like me to give you a tour of the place? Yes, please. Welcome to the tour of the SG Ghana Innovate. The lines under the floor directs you to any of our offices. The orange line takes you to the Koopa Cappuccino. The purple line takes you to the place has been designed in such that identify and tell you where you want to go. The line takes you to the Sesame Square. The blue line takes you to the Katokraba. Thank you and have a good day. So how they've designed the hub in such that it, it follows a line. So if you want to visit an office or any person in the office, when you go and you talk to Ama, Ama will tell you, if I want to visit to this man, I should follow this line. So when you talk to Ama, Ama will tell you, okay, you want to meet Josh. Follow this line to meet Josh. That is what Ama is trying to demonstrate over here. You have a question? All right. Yeah. All right. So my name is Ishmael. Yeah. So um, it's interesting Ama is talking. But Ama doesn't really feel like Ghanaian to me. She sounds more foreign. Why is that? So, uh, currently, Ama cannot speak Chi. He's asking about whether Ama will be able to communicate local language. But Ama cannot speak Chi at the moment. And so, what Ama understands here is English. The nation. Oh, okay, okay. So, uh, it's natural language processing. And we... It gets better the more you feed it with data and information. It's an AI assistant. So the more you feed it with data, AMA will be much more Ghanaian and understanding the language that you want to speak to. So it's also still in development. So AMA needs more what? People talking to it. Ghanaian voices in that case. So by default, when you set it up, you have different voices that you want to pick it up from there. So once you set it up that way, it will use that language to communicate with you until it gets better. Uh, at a point in time, they even spoke about the, the evolution of this voice assistant in such that you, you can use your own voice. So once you set it up, you will read some basic sentences, and then once the system gets it, you will be able to speak like you. And I think Facebook had managed to get this as a, this Morgan Freeman to be able to speak to him in his voice assistant home. So you get there as you move along the line. Thank you. On the website Forbes.com, they say, Cisco estimates that the Internet of Things is having a potential value of $14 trillion and that 27%, or nearly $4 trillion, will be found in manufacturing, Rockwell CEO Keith Nosbush told CIO Review. This is by far the biggest opportunity across the entire Internet of Things landscape. People also sometimes ask me, what is the usefulness of Internet of Things? Do you want to hear the answer? Yes. On the website intechopen.com, they say, Internet of Things can create information about the connected objects, analyze it, and make decisions. In other words, one can tell that the Internet of Things is smarter than the Oh, he's gone. Uh, he's tired. All right, so uh, I'll leave it to Josh to also do an demonstration of the smart home, in this case, for a light bulb. Thank you. All right, so uh, what we just had was the Google Assistant. So that's a combination of IoT and AI um, being merged together. And this, is, this very product is a reception. The company is trying to replace a human being with his <laughs> smart reception. So when you go there, you talk to the rece reception, the smart device, and then to tell you whoever you have to see, a book appointment for you or call the person for you. So this is what is happening here in Ghana. Somebody trying to do. All right. Can you help me? Not so far. Is it OK? OK. All right, so um, what we have here is uh, one of our projects for the smart home. So with a smart home, um, as I said, or he even talked about, you can literally control your home from a phone, from wherever you are in the world. So including your lights, your AC, your TV, your fridge, or you have a water pump or irrigation in the house. Like whatever appliances you have in the house, you can control it from your phone, from wherever you are. So from a touch on the bottom, on the app here, 
this light to come on. It can also be connected to a TV or any appliances here and be able to control it from the phone. And another tap again, the light goes off. Right. And one beauty about this system, once the light is on, you're able to tell the power consumption, the status of your light, how much energy is consuming at any point in time. So that means at the end of the month in your house, you can know your fridge, your AC, your light bulbs, your ironing, how each of these appliances in the home are consuming. The reason why all these new technologies are coming up are as a result of data, information. Now the currency of our generation, the 21st century, is no more the money or the coin, it's information, it's data. The company or the people or the country that have moved most of the data controls the world now. So data is a currency of our generation now. Um, I don't know if any of you want to try. We could pass it by for you to give it a try. Anybody want to try? Okay. So there's a button there, the ash button. You tap and wait. Then you tap and then it comes back again. All right. So assuming once you were coming here, you were in hurry, you forgot to turn off your AC or your light, they're going to be on the whole day. By the time you go home, you have some bill to pay for just forgetting to turn off your AC. So it could also happen that the reason why we are not able to manage our electricity or we are paying so much in bill is not because we use all this energy. Mostly we waste a high number of this energy we generate. So with smart solutions or smart technologies, you'll be able to efficiently manage the energy we have. And when we add AI to it, it can also adapt to your preference and know when you turn on light, when you turn on AC, and then always adapt to your preference without you necessarily controlling them. The system will be able to, as I mentioned, the fifth industrial revolution where you're going to have mass customization. You have this in your home, your fridge, your bed, everything will be connected. They will learn from your behavior and then always make sure they adapt to your behavior. When you leave the house, automatically door locks, light closes, every appliance goes off. The moment you open your door, the door comes on. These are many things are what are going to happen in the future. I didn't talk about driverless car, drones, like so many technologies we can't talk about today. So all these are emerging technologies coming up in our generation, creating new industries, creating new jobs, displacing all the old jobs and the old factories. So that's why it's very important everybody join this revolution. Thank you.